let you guys pray. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of Future Vision and the many people it blesses. Continue to use this um, for your glory and for your honour. We thank you for everyone it touches, Lord. And we just thank you for the faithful servants who, who are involved, Lord. Continue to encourage and bless them. Thank you for Ian and Liz and so many more, Lord. We thank you for their heart for you that just extends to others, we pray. So we leave this in your care and we thank you for faith as well. We are so blessed as a church to have her involved, Lord, and Waldingfield for all she does for you, for her love for you. Continue to bless her and her family, Lord. Just show her new mercies, Lord, and just really work in her families for, so we can give you more praise and honour, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. And, and Father, we thank you for every open door that there is. We thank you uh, for the news about the primary schools and, and the openness that there is, the crosses on the walls, the, the, uh, the Bibles that are there, the stories that are being received. We thank you too for all that goes on in the secondary schools. And uh, Lord, we commit every one of those to you. Please keep the doors open, Lord. Please keep the prayer spaces open. Uh, please keep uh, the um, different groups that are there for children, and young people and teachers, donuts as well. Lord, bless them, we pray. May your Holy Spirit inspire and go on doing so. And we pray for fruit from all those ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 People, children, kids, you must go. Adults, keep standing. We're going to sing a song together.
worried about over uh, the school. You know, we say, up from the ashes, hope will arise. We pray for the bereavement, the issues, the anxiety, the fears, the worry. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Lord, we thank you for the work of future vision. We thank you for the way that you bring hope into darkness, the way that you bring light into issues. And Lord, we just pray for this place. We pray that you will continue to do a miracle in the work of this place. We pray for the Christian teachers as well. We pray for the Christian cleaners. We just pray for all those in this place that know you. And Lord, we pray that light will just grow and grow. That Lord, what you have started, you will continue to work out. With Ian moving on and somebody coming in, that Lord, you will just rise up hope. You will rise up you in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your seats. We always pray. That's quite good in our church. We always do. <laughs> <laughs> Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be together in a Christian community this morning. Thank you for the word of God. When we hear you speak through the word of God, and Lord, you sometimes speak through fantastic preachers who come to share with us. Dear friends, thank you so much for faith. Would you fill her heart, fill her lips, and fill her life with the things that will inspire us today and inspire her? Will you make up for her all that she gives out so that she is also refilled? In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I want to read, first of all, from Ephesians 3, which is like a prayer and a prayer for your church. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May that be true. I was at the trustees meeting earlier this month and went away actually very excited about what was God was doing here among you. That is not always true at a trustees meeting, but that was lovely. I went home really delighted and inspired by what God is doing. And one word has kept coming back to me since, and that was transformation. It is pertinent to individuals and the body of Christ here where he's placed us. And transformation obviously occurs as a result of repentance. Until we're changed inside, there is no transformation. When we have the Holy Spirit living within us and our lives, our hearts and our actions are right with God, transformation can take place. We are new creations. And looking at your vision, I believe that is what you long to see. And I have to say, it's what I long to see in the two churches where I'm responsible in, Waldingfield and Acton. We are transformed. We need to be transformed to become more like Jesus and to see our communities transformed by his love and his power. So I share with you this morning what has come from that image of repentance and transformation for me. 
You may or may not have read a book, but Tom Wright wrote a book called Broken Signposts, which I've read, which catalogues where we are as a broken society and a world that struggles to make sense of what is happening. And I think it would be fair to say that the signposts of direction which we used to be able to rely on are now turned the wrong way or are simply broken. You may, like me, despair as you watch and listen to those who govern us, quarrel and shout each other down, and have really very little to tell us that we want to hear. The moral compass is no longer working. And Tom says we live in a culture that's demanding, but actually really wants to belong, that believes that success and wealth will satisfy, but actually is longing for relationship that wants to love and be loved, but notes that our human relationships often fail to meet the standard required. So what we need is to be transformed. We need things to change, and we know who can do it. Jesus came into the brokenness of his culture, and he spoke the truth of the gospel into it, and lives were changed. The beginning of our transformation is, of course, repentance and having our lives turned around. We can be forgiven when we come in repentance to Father God, when we say sorry and we turn our backs on what has gone before and we fix instead our eyes on Jesus. We get another chance because we are so deeply loved. A love that will transform not just us, but will change our community. But it has to start with me and with you. When we're transformed, we will have everything we need to offer people around us the truth, a truth that changes relationships, that builds community, that connects us with one another. And the truth is Jesus, because he said he was. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth is love the love of God which transforms us from the people we are to the people we could be and can be. I think it was Max Lucado who said, Jesus loves us as we are. He died for us as we are, but he loves us enough not to leave us as we are, but to make us more and more like him. Love was why God created us in the first place. He didn't have to make a beautiful world for us to share. He wanted to. His love is most evident when he died on our behalf. He didn't wait, fortunately, to we're nicer or better people. He did it when we were still in a mess. And our response to that love is to repent and allow him to transform our lives so that we can then love others particularly those who the rest of the world leaves on the sidelines and doesn't bother with. The mission of Jesus that Isaiah wrote about in chapter 61 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And that's often worked out in practice when we are communities of love and repentance. You will know through Abby's footprints, through care for those who live in Clover Court, through those love gifts, if you happen to trip, for the community that prays for the needs of those around them. And then perhaps most importantly, the God-given moments when we can share our faith. Earlier this year, I took a funeral in the village and at the request of the family, I made my way to the pub afterwards for the wake. After a little while, one of the deceased lady's sons came up to me and she sa he said, can I talk to you? And I said, yes, of course you can. He said, I want to know where my mum is. And wherever she is, how do I get to go there? And I thought, that's a pretty good question. Don't very often get that asked in church, but in the pub, that's fine. This gentleman I'd only met once before in preparation for the funeral. He has everything that the world has to offer. He has a beautiful home 
quality cars, plenty of foreign holidays, but no eternal hope for the future. So none of those things are really worth anything. So we talked about his mum, who I do believe is now with God because her faith was a very important part of her life. And he said, but what do I need to do to get there myself? And I said, well, it's very easy. You've just got to say sorry to God for all the things that have gone wrong and get right with him. And then your place is assured in heaven where your mum is. He said, okay, got a lot more questions. And of course, there was a lot of other people there wanting to talk to him because he was the son or one of them. And he said, but I promise I will think that through and find out more. So we pray that God will transform his life from having everything from a worldview, but nothing that really matters. A relationship with God through repentance and forgiveness that will assure his place one day to be with Jesus. God is love. We are loved beyond measure. And God is for us and longs to transform us to be more like him. He takes delight in us. He expressed his love for us in the words of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave. And a love like that, I guess, will also affect our community. They tell me that giving is love in action, but with backbone. Mother Teresa said, faith in action is love, and love in action is service. Doing something. That was the response of the woman who poured out her very expensive ointment on Jesus' feet. Her reaction to being accepted and loved was to give the most special and precious thing that she had to the man who'd shown her that love and forgiveness. Cost didn't enter the equation. And I guess the best sort of giving is when nothing at all is expected in return. Then life transformed by God will have eyes to see what he sees. As we become more and more transformed into his image, we too will see the world as Jesus sees it. And we'll see those around us from a very different viewpoint. There are times when we don't have God's view and we need to. And we'll start to notice things we've never noticed before because being secure and safe in God's love changes our perspective and gives us fresh vision. What might have annoyed us just a tiny bit before reminds us, hang on a minute, you've been forgiven for what you get wrong. We need to do that too. Because we don't always understand the circumstances that have brought people to where they are. And we need to see them with God's eyes of love and forgiveness. Eyes that look beyond what they are to what they could become when they're transformed by his love. I think of Zacchaeus hiding up a tree so others wouldn't see him, but wanting himself to see this man Jesus. And Jesus noticed. He noticed the pain of a woman dragged before him for adultery by hypocritical leaders who didn't meet the standard or keep the rules either. He noticed the man sitting by the pool who had spent spent much of his life sitting there and just waited for someone to do something about his health. He noticed a group of lepers banished from their towns and villages who were untouchable except by the man who offered them healing. He noticed who was missing when he made an appearance to his disciples after the resurrection and he came back for Thomas to show him that he was there And despite his disbelief, he held out his hands to him and said, I'm here. I am alive and well. He noticed two very disconsolate disciples leaving Jerusalem to go to Emmaus. And he went and walked with them and met their need. Our transformation will help us to see with new eyes and with a heart of compassion that Jesus had for those in need. And then our community will also begin the road to transformation. And God's kingdom will come here on earth. And Jesus used the image of a mustard seed in his kingdom. That's where it starts. It only needs to be tiny. But though it's tiny itself, when it grows, it becomes big. 
The farmer sows his seeds, it grows silently. He can't do anything about it until the shoots appear above the ground. He can sleep, he can work, he can watch, but it won't make any odds. It comes itself. It happens outside of him. The disciples and the people of Jesus' time were expecting a Messiah, and they were expecting a new kingdom where God ruled. They had no idea what that would look like or how it would come into being. And it was really difficult for them to imagine that a baby born in a stable in Bethlehem and who died outside the city walls of Jerusalem could bring about the sort of change they needed and wanted. Doesn't look like a recipe for growth. Our diocese keeps sending me bits of paper. How are you growing? Well, I can show them this bit. (laughs) But I don't think that's what they're looking for. How are you growing? What are you doing? How is it being affected? We live in a scientific and precise age, so we have machines that drop seeds in the right quantity and at the right depth. We might do a bit of watering and some sunshine helps and maybe some fertilizer in the soil. But in essence, the seed has the life and growth within itself, and we're called to plant the seed. The first sentence of that parable, though, that Jesus talks about says the seeds are scattered, absolutely no precision at all. They're just flung wherever they go and land, they stay. And that's a fabulous picture of the kingdom of God, whose kingdom this is. There's no shortage of seeds. You can be liberal with them. You can throw them where you like because we have a generous God. He's never going to run out of seed because he doesn't ever come out to the end of his love or care for his people. He's lavish, not precise, because he doesn't see any seed as being waste. He gives the widest possible opportunities and he goes wherever. And sometimes he sows his seeds and showers his love in the most unlikely of places and characters, usually in our opinion, but he does. There's no fear or favour with God because he sees potential in that transformation. He can make us into the people we should be. And he knows when we repent, he can transform every part of our lives. Behind God's generosity is God's belief that each one of his creation has amazing possibilities. And he's right, you see it. The tiniest of seeds can be a beautiful and amazing plant. And that's what God wants for us. Seeds can be buried in the earth and lay dormant for years. Often stories are told of children who learnt at school about Jesus. And it's not till they're much, much older that something comes back into their mind. And they think, hmm, I heard that in school. The seed was sown, but many years later the growth emerged. My husband works in High Point. He doesn't stay there, you understand. He works there and um, as a volunteer chaplain and he sees lives turned around as prisoners see the work of God and have their lives changed. No one is beyond God's reach or love. When I think back to the start of Future Vision with Chris Rowe 20 plus years ago, she saw a need amongst youngsters at school who needed to know about God's love and God's help and companionship in their lives. And from that tiny seed, we now have two chaplains in Thomas Gainsborough. We have an open the book, sharing the Bible stories with drama and props in our local primary schools. And what pleased me most was Ruth Ridge in the Methodist Church in Sudbury said to me the other day, do you know, she said two or three weeks ago, we baptised a young woman at St John's. And when we talked to her, her journey started when she heard the stories from Open the Book at Potkiln School. A long time after. But God used those seeds and they began to grow. Chris could not have envisioned that when she first planted that little seed 20 odd years ago. And all of us can be involved in that process by sharing our transformed lives making sure they are transformed because we've been repentant before God, not just once, but often. And by sharing our journey with others, and by looking to see where God is at work and where need is, 
and joining in. We confess that not all seeds will grow into healthy plants. What Jesus did sometimes was of no interest to the people of his day. They didn't want to know. Many rejected him, and yet all the kingdoms of the earth will be blessed because of him. He was the, exactly the right seed that would produce the most amazing harvest the world could imagine, because from him comes our forgiveness by his death and resurrection. However small the beginning, God can do above and beyond what we ask or think possible. So how can we know what God might do when those who no longer can get to church pray? It's vital. How can we know what God will do through the person who pops around to the neighbour when they're not too good and helps them, sorts them out? Or Clover Link goes to those homes and sees love in action. How can we know what God might do through someone sharing their personal journey of faith when somebody asks, why are you like you are? What is it that drives you? And how can we know what God will do with our lives when we repent and live in obedience and relationship with him? And in God's economy, there are no age barriers. You can't get out of it because you say, well, I can't do what I used to do. There are still things you can do. Just remember who our God is, what he's promised. His kingdom will one day be exactly as he said, and he will have the power and the glory. And how do we help that kingdom to grow? By starting in small ways, by scattering the seed liberally. God will do the growing. And one day the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. From small beginnings, God's kingdom grows. What might he do with our lives, this church, if we come in repentance to him, have our lives and our vision turned around and be transformed to be more and more like him? I am excited for you and I pray that you will pray for Waldingfield and Acton. We are seeing some little shoots of growth and how lovely that is. There's a lady who's asked me to go and see her this week. She said, I want to know more, and I think I might want to be confirmed. I'll be there. I'll see you on Tuesday. And you never know, do you? And that came from the larder, a thing we do on a Friday, um, providing food so that stuff is not wasted. And she's begun to come, and she wants to know more. So that's lovely. So... I am excited for you, blessed by you as God works with you to change this part of his world. And may that continue to grow. Amen. sing a few songs first um, try and just let that word sink into us to let it dwell in us um, yeah. let's just give ourselves a moment of silence before we worship and sing
Thank you.
Lord, we exalt you. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your presence in each one of us. We exalt you. The same night in which he was betrayed and handed over, Jesus took bread and gave thanks for it. Then he distributed it to his disciples and said, take it and, and eat your fill. It's my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it and whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes again. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a wrong spirit will be guilty of dishonoring the body and blood of the Lord. So let each individual first evaluate their own attitude and then eat the bread and drink the cup. We move from songs of worship and praise, from scripture and preaching, from testimony and presentation and announcements. And we enter a short time of thoughtfulness and thanksgiving for the covenant love of God expressed in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. For those of you who know that your faith in God has been life-changing and personal and ongoing and genuine. Everyone who has experienced the new life which Jesus gives to those who trust him, you are welcome to eat the bread and drink this cup in loving remembrance freely. For those of you who are still considering whether to enter the Jesus-centered life and be born again and haven't yet done so, we ask you to observe what is being said and done without taking the bread and wine on this occasion. However, this may be the day this may be the exact time when you move into the family of God by faith in Jesus' name. So quietly, please, if that relates to you, and simply ask the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and to fill you with his spirit and love just take some moments while I go on and on to do this. Because when you've done so, you can share that communion with us. At communion, we remember the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross to forgive and bring us forgiveness of sins and his resurrection from the dead to bring us new life in him through the Holy Spirit. Communion symbolizes the arrangement that God has with us. It's an amazing arrangement. He calls it a covenant. This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of Jesus' blood. Communion provides an opportunity for self-examination, a check of our heart condition, and I don't mean medically. Because the word says, examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. Communion gives expressions to our faith so that others may know 
that Jesus' death is the only cure for sin and that we are celebrating the difference his death has made in our lives. We are renouncing the Lord's death until he comes again. So, just before we take bread and wine, it would be good to pause and reflect on the enormity of his love for us and for other believers sitting around us. Let's consider the extent of his sacrifice on the cross. Think about how little we deserve it and how amazing and different his love is from all other loves. Let's let our minds and souls be filled with gladness at the forgiveness and assurance that are ours because of his gift of grace. Let's consider that he is alive right now, waiting to hear our expressions of love to him. And let's look ahead at a time when we will be seated with him in heaven at the ultimate banquet of the ages. Wow. We pause to allow all these words to sink in. And then I'm going to pray. So, Lord, you are holy and awesome and merciful. If you measured and marked us because of our sins, who would ever have any prayers answered? But your forgiving love is what makes you so wonderful. No wonder you are loved and worshipped. Thank you. So blessed to our bodies, blessed to our souls, blessed to our spirits, this bread and this wine. Lord, we take these symbols with remembrance and thanksgiving. For Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.